In the study of the scriptures, we find many warnings from the Lord to help us on our upward journey. One of those warnings is found in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21 says, And thine ears shall hear a word behind thee, saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left. These warnings are there to be able to help us, to always bring us back on track. We tend to, have, we tend to go off path a lot, it seems like, so the Holy Spirit's going to be there to warn us, to bring us back to the path. Now, there are many parts of scriptures that are quite easy to understand. We can read the story, we can understand them quite simply. But there are some parts of the Bible that are a little bit more difficult of comprehension. We find this written down in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. It says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as in all his epistles, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to be understood which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. So here it shows that Apostle Paul has written some things that are hard to be understood. And those people who want to, they twist what he has said to their own destruction, just like they do other scriptures. And by the way, this is another evidence that the New Testament is also called scriptures. Now, when it says it is hard to be understood, it does not mean impossible. There's a big difference between hard and impossible. These things may be hard to be understood, but they are not impossible. With the Holy Spirit's guidance, we are able to have some understanding of these things. Whenever we find things in the Bible that are hard to be understood, it simply shows us that the Scriptures is of divine origin. Just like God, there's not everything that we can understand about God. And so there are many things that are secret, that are not revealed unto us. In Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse 29, Deuteronomy 29 and verse 29, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So there are things that are secret, those things which belong only unto God, but those things that are revealed, they are revealed to us and to our children, so we may do all the words of this law. But in order for us to understand them, we must have a teachable mind. We must be willing to understand. It says in John 7:17, 7, If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine, whether I speak of God or whether I speak of myself. In order for us to understand the doctrines properly, we must have a willingness to understand these things. Now some of those things that are secret happen to have been made known to the Apostle Paul. Romans chapter 16 verses 25 and 26. Romans chapter 16 verses 25 and 26. It says, Now to him that is of power to establish you, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known of all nations for the obedience of faith. So some of these things which were secret, those things which were mysterious for all eternal ages, they have now been revealed. And some of them were revealed to Paul. But keep in mind, there are some things that Paul wrote that are hard to be understood. And it is only as we take the Holy Spirit to guide us. Remember we read there in the last previous to the last lesson, that, that when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. Remember when we were studying about the Holy Spirit, it is only as we pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit that we can have the true understanding of these things. 
But keep in mind as we study these issues that what part of the scripture is important for us to study. Let's look at 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17 again. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all scripture is given for us to understand. One of these points in which there are difficulties in studying the scriptures in regard to the law of God. It's very difficult for some people as they study the Bible to realize that the Bible speaks about two different laws. In our last lesson, we studied about the moral law of God, about the law that is eternal, that is always going to last. And i just like to read a few statements about the law that is eternal. I'm not going to spend too much time on that one. I want to spend a little bit of time about that law that has come in afterwards. Let us look at James chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. James chapter 2 verses 8 and 9. It says, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. If ye have respect to per persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. So we find here speaking about the royal law. So James, who is writing in the Christian dispensation, speaks about the royal, royal law. Now which law is this royal law? What did it say there? It says, if you fulfill the royal law, according to the scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You remember the words of Jesus when the rich young ruler came to him. He told him about two laws, one that loves to God and one that is loving your neighbor as yourself. So when we're speaking here about the royal law, it includes something that is called here love your neighbor as thyself. So the royal law is the law that says love your neighbor as yourself. Now which law is this law that says love your neighbor as thyself? What do we mean by loving your neighbor as yourself? Let us look at Romans chapter 13 and verse 9. Romans chapter 13 and verse 9. For thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, by the way, any other commandment, is that singular or plural? It is singular. So let us take a look here. When it says, love your neighbor as yourself, what does it really mean? Does it sound familiar, these statements? It says, first one says, thou shalt not commit adultery. That you will recognize to be the seventh commandment. The next one says, thou shalt not kill. That you will recognize as the sixth commandment. And then it says, thou shalt not steal. That again is the Eighth Commandment. And then it goes on, Thou shalt not bear false witness, that is your Ninth Commandment, and Thou shalt not covet, which is your Tenth Commandment. So here you find that one aspect of the Ten Commandments are mentioned as Thou shalt love your neighbor as yourself. But it goes on and it says, And if there be any other singular commandment, singular, any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the only other commandment that has reference to our neighbor is the fifth commandment that is not in relationship to God himself. So you find here when it says that the royal law when James is talking about the royal law being that law that says thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself Paul gives the illustration that we are talking here about this part of the Ten Commandments. 
So the royal law includes, is that law that includes these particular points. So we're talking about the moral law as we were studying quite in depth in our last lesson. <clears throat> now let us consider for a few minutes about the purpose of Jesus coming to this world. Why did Jesus come here? Let us look at Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus means what? He shall save his people from. From their sins. He does not say he shall save his people in their sins, but he shall save his people from their sins. Now, what do we mean by sa being saved from sin? What do we mean when we say that we need to repent and be saved from sin? What is sin? Do you know what sin is? The Bible has only one definition of sin. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, Romans 7 and verse 7, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So here it mentions that what is sin? I don't even know what sin is unless I have a law. So without the law there is no knowledge of sin. We, in order to know what sin is, in order to be able to identify sin, we must be able to have the law of God. And here it mentions which law? It's that law that says, thou shalt not covet. So here again is mentioned this law. So without this law, what we call the moral law, the Ten Commandments, without that law, we don't know what sin is. And we're not only talking about the last ten that talks about loving your neighbor as yourself, the last part, but we're also talking here about the first part of the Ten Commandments that speak about our relationship to God. So Jesus is coming in this world to save us from violation of the law of God. For these reasons, the law has a specific purpose. Let's look in Galatians 3 and verse 24. Galatians 3 and verse 24. It says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. So the schoolmaster here is not a teacher. The word here, schoolmaster, actually was a truant officer, the father's slave back in the days of the Greeks, the pedagogue. He was the father's slave who would grab the son and he would take him to school and he would do everything necessary to make sure he gets to school. And so the law of God, the Ten Commandments, is there to make sure that we get to Jesus, that we realize the need to get to Christ. So we find that this law is the law that identifies sin. If this law of Ten Commandments was abolished on the cross, then we would not need repentance. Today, repentance would be unnecessary because Jesus would have gotten rid of the law and we would not know what sin is. But sin is still existent because that law, as we have studied again, I mentioned in the last lesson, the law is eternal. Also, we know that there is a judgment. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 9, Ecclesiastes chapter 11 and verse 9, it says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart, and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. You see, there is a judgment coming. Every single one of us are going to have to have a judgment. We're going to have to be affected in the judgment. Now, how do we know that every one of us are going to be in the judgment? Let's look at Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. Romans chapter 14 and verse 10. It says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. So every one of us are going to be judged. Now, when we're judged, there must be something to be judged by. What are we going to be judged by in the judgment? Let's go back again to James chapter 2 and verse 12. James chapter 2 and verse 12. 
It says, so speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So again, here is mentioned the law of liberty. And in this context, let's go back a little bit, verses 8 through 12, so we can see the whole context of what is the law of liberty. What is that royal law? It says here, If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, but if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So all of these verses here are combined together. The royal law, the law of liberty, all these terms have reference to the Ten Commandments. But now, we see clearly that this law was eternal, always existed. But now, there is another law. A law that did not exist before sin. You see, this law would have to exist before Adam and Eve sinned. If this law did not exist before Adam and Eve sinned, there would be no sin. And so let's just put it here on a board a little bit more for us to take a look at. If, we, if this law, the law of Ten Commandments, identifies sin, then when we look at the time that sin entered, the sin entered into this world in the time of Adam and Eve. Now, Adam and Eve were created before sin. And they were living in the Garden of Eden before sin entered in. Now, what is sin? Sin is transgression of the law. Sin is violation of this law. If sin is the violation of that law, and sin entered here, then the law must have been in existence at that time to reveal that sin. So this law of Ten Commandments must have existed here. Without that law, there would be no knowledge of sin. But now another law was also introduced. It was not the law of Ten Commandments. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 15, it speaks about this law. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. So speaking about Jesus, what did he do? When he came to this world, when he lived a life here, it says when he came to the cross of Calvary, what happens? There was a law that has commandments contained in ordinances. And what did he do? He abolished that law. This law was abolished. Now, if this verse has reference to the Ten Commandments, then we will never need Jesus anymore. We don't need to come to Jesus because if it was Ten Commandments, then sin no longer exists. There is nothing right and there's nothing wrong. Everything is right. So, <clears throat> this law contained in ordinances. What is this law contained in ordinances? Let's look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. What was this law that was done away with? Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So there was a law uh, containing ordinances that was nailed to the cross. So there is a law that was nailed on the cross that does not exist anymore. It is finished. It is done with. Now, which law is this? Is this talking about the Ten Commandments law? Is it according to this verse here? It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, that was contrary to us. Is the Ten Commandments that way? Let us take a look as God created Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31. 
Genesis 1 verse 31 says, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. So when God created Adam and Eve, and the law was existence, the Ten Commandments law was existent at that time, God said it was very good. And yet in Colossians, there's a law there that says what? That that law is contrary to us. It is against us. It had enmity against us. So this cannot be speaking about the Ten Commandments. It is impossible. And besides, those Ten Commandments are of eternal nature. Let's look at Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So Jesus makes it very clear here that Jesus did not come to get rid of that law. Oh no, he did not come to get rid of it, he came to fulfill it. And that's why it says in the next verse, as long as heaven and earth is around, that law still will be there. So that law clearly is still in existence. But what is this law of ordinances then? What law are we talking about here that contains ordinances? Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 through 21. Let no man, therefore, judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. Notice here, these things are what? They are a shadow of things to come. Here it mentions of the Sabbath days. There were seven yearly Sabbaths that were a shadow of things to come in the Jewish economy. Now what does it mean they were a shadow of things to come? Is there a law that's a shadow of things to come? Is there a law that points forward to something in the future? Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. It says, for the law, again it mentions the law, for the law having a shadow of good things to come. Oh, notice here, in Colossians it mentions that the law was nailed to the cross. And then it talks about that law which was a shadow of good things to come. And here again it mentions that there is the law that was a shadow of good things to come. And not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So the law that was nailed to the cross involved sacrifices. It involved sacrifices. So when we're talking about that law in Colossians and other places, we're talking about the law that was done away with. We're not talking about this law. Because the Ten Commandments, you read it from beginning to the end, there are no sacrifices associated with it. There is not one sacrifice. But there is a law here that was nailed to the cross that involves sacrifices. That was the law that was done away with. Let me read again verse uh, 1 through 4. Hebrews chapter 10 verses 1 through 4. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So there were sacrifices that were offered year by year. Not just day by day but there were those that were yearly sacrifices. Those things as well. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more remembrance of sins. What was the problem with those sacrifices? They may make the sacrifice, but they still remember the sins. If these sacrifices were of value, then they would not remember their sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of those sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. The problem with that particular law that involved sacrifices was that the blood of animals cannot take away sins. A blood of a bull, or of a goat, or of a sheep, they cannot take away 
my sin. For that reason, that law had nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. That was a law that involved sacrifices. But Jesus, the gospel, can take away sins. Jesus is able to do that for Romans 1.16 For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel has something in it. Now among the first sacrifices that were made in, the, in this world was made by Abel. In Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 records one of those very first sacrifices. It says by faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. So we find here that Abel offered sacrifices also unto God. He was one of the very first men that did so. And what did he offer as a sacrifice and why did he offer it? Let's go to Genesis chapter 4 verses 2 through 4. Genesis chapter 4 verses 2 through 4. It says, And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the soil. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So what did Abel do? Abel, he brought of the firstlings of his flock. In other words, he brought of his flock, and what flock did he have? He had the flock of sheep. And the firstling is the young one. So he brought a lamb. Now why did Abel bring a lamb? What was the reason for bringing a lamb? The John the Baptist made it very clear when he said in John 1, 29, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world when he saw Jesus coming. So right from the very beginning of this world's history, they were offering a lamb to represent Jesus. So was a lamb a shadow of good things to come? Was it pointing forward to something that was going to be better? Absolutely, it was pointing forward to something better. Later on, the Lord instituted the sanctuary service among the children of Israel, and especially the Passover service. In Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, He told them that they was to take a lamb that was without blemish to be the Passover lamb. In 1 Peter 1, verse 19, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 19, it talks about Jesus, that lamb, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. So they were to take the lamb during the Passover service, take a lamb and offer a spotless lamb as the Passover lamb. Well, Jesus was a lamb without blemish and without spot. And more especially, it was the Passover lamb that represented Jesus Christ. Let us look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, Christ clearly is that Passover lamb. But not only did Abel offer a sacrifice, let us look at another sacrifice that was made in the, also in the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 21 and 22. Genesis 3, 21 and 22. And to Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now in order to make a coat of skin, what is necessary? Quite clearly here you must kill an animal. You cannot keep an animal alive and take their skin and make a coat out of it. It is impossible. Well, although this verse does not mention what type of animal did God use, we believe by looking at Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 that this coat of skin must have been made from a lamb. Revelation chapter 13 
and verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship Him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So here it says that the, Jesus is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And so it would be quite appropriate that that very first animal sacrifice was actually a lamb. Now, why was a lamb slain right there at the very beginning? What was God trying to impress our first parents? Let's again look at Hebrews chapter 9. This time let's look at verse 22. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood is no remission. They have to be impressed upon their mind that unless there's a shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Now keep in mind, did they need to shed blood before they sinned? Absolutely not. They did not need to have shedding of blood. So long as they were keeping the law, there was no need for remission of sins. It is only after sin entered in, after our first parents violated the law of God, that there was needing a law that would bring about sacrifices to impress upon their minds that they need to have blood shed in order to have their sins wiped clean. For this reason, we read in Colossians 2 verse 14, that He took those ordinances away and He nailed it to the cross. Those ordinances that had to do with the sacrificial system, those that were a shadow of good things to come. So right from the very beginning of the Garden of Eden, when they had sinned, and later on with Abel and others, they began to perform animal sacrifices. These animal sacrifices pointed forward to the plan of redemption affected by Jesus Christ. It points forward to the time that Jesus would be the one that would die for them, that it would be His blood that was shed that would take away their sins. Again, this cannot be referring to the Ten Commandments law because there's a blessing placed upon those who keep the law. Revelation 22, 14 says, Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates of the city. So now why was the law done away with this other law? Not the moral law. We're talking about this law that involved sacrifices. And we, used, we have called it the ceremonial law because it involves ceremonies. It is not dealing with a moral nature. It's dealing with ceremonies that their purpose is to show us the coming Messiah that He can cleanse us from our sins. Why did it have to be do done away with? Hebrews chapter 7, verse 28. Hebrews 7 and verse 28. It says, For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the Son who is consecrated forevermore. So here is a law that is mentioned here. It is a law that maketh priests. Which law makes priests? Which is that law? Verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God. So we have a law here that makes men priests. And it is that law that we're talking about here. And again, in that law that made priests, that made animal sacrifices, that law could not save anyone. That law could not cleanse us from sin. As we read in chapter 10, verse 1, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. It was impossible. They could not make those who came there perfect. They couldn't be done. And so that law had to be abolished. But the blood of Jesus... Can the blood of Jesus make someone perfect? Let us look at Hebrews chapter 9, verses 25 and 26. 
Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25 and 26 says, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy places every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So Jesus came here to do what? To offer himself and as he offered himself he was able to put away sin. And why was he able to do that? Keep in mind, as we stated not very long ago, Jesus is eternal God. And as he came and he died on the cross, he was able to put away sins. Now why is it that it is only the blood of Jesus? Why is it that this blood is able to cleanse us from sin? Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other name. There is no other way. There is no way to have salvation except through Jesus Christ. And praise the Lord for that. There is a way. Unfortunately, the Jewish people on many occasions they refused to look beyond the sacrificial system they could not see beyond they looked at the sacrifice itself and so what did they do let's look at Isaiah chapter 1 verses 10 through 15 Isaiah chapter 1 verses 10 through 15 what did they do it says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. And he's speaking to the Israelites here. To what purpose is this multitude of your sacrifices unto me? It says, saith the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me the new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies. I cannot away with it. It is iniquity even the solemn meetings. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide my face from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. He said, I don't want to hear it anymore. I don't want to see it anymore. I'm tired of your animal sacrifices. They felt like, oh, I'm just going to go ahead and make an animal sacrifice and I'll commit a sin. It's like I remember one time I was listening to the radio and a man called up and he says, oh, I'm just about ready to go on the way to do some adultery. And the man said, what do you mean you're going to go commit adultery? He says, oh, that's no problem because on my way home I'm going to stop by and I'm going to stop by the church and take care of it. What a sad situation. This is exactly what the Jewish nation had come down to. They had made the sacrifice all something and the uh, meaning of the sacrifice nothing. And for that reason, Jesus realized and God decided they're going to get rid of that entire system because when Jesus came, He is the one that could help them understand what it was all about. In Psalm 51, verses 17 through 19. Psalm 51, verse 17 through 19. What are the sacrifices that God wants? What does He really want from you and me? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, Thou wilt not despise. Do good in Thy pleasure, unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then shall they offer bullocks upon my altar. So God was pleading with the children of Israel, oh, if you'd only understand the reality that it's pointing to the coming Redeemer, and if they could accept the coming Redeemer as their personal Savior, they would be able to have hope. Then God would have accepted their services. He would have accepted them, that is, until Calvary. Because once Jesus came, those were unnecessary. God wanted a change of heart. This is why as we go down to Isaiah chapter 1 again, Isaiah chapter 1, God through this prophet began to appeal to the people of Israel, to the people of Judah. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. It says, Wash you. Make you clean, 
put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He's appealing to them, please come unto me. Let us reason together so we can solve this problem. It's only as we come to God, only as we come to Him as the real Savior, not those animals. Those animals were pointing forward to the coming Redeemer. If they did not look to the coming Redeemer, those animal sacrifices did not help them one bit. For this reason, Jesus needed to come. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. It is only Jesus Christ, through his death, through his blood offered on Calvary, that can take away the sins. Those services there could do no good. None of those sacrifices, those law, that law of ceremonies that was instituted right here at, as soon as sin entered in, they began the sacrificial system. Later on it in, turned it into the entire sanctuary service. It all pointed forward to the coming Messiah to take away sins. To continue these services after the cross would be insulting our Creator because it would be saying that we are still looking for the coming Messiah. We're still looking for the one to come. And oh, I hope that we're not doing that. This is why it says that law was nailed to the cross. That law was put away, but the moral law was never changed. It stands immutable. It stands eternal. Now, is there any purpose for us to study that ceremonial system today? Is there any reason for us to study these things? Well, you remember the statement in Romans 15, 4, it says, For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Whatsoever things were written aforetime. Also, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture, how much? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Also, we have the example of Jesus. What did Jesus do when He began to teach the people about Himself? We read in Luke chapter 24 and verse 27. Luke 24 and verse 27. It says, And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, He expounded unto them in all the Scriptures the things concerning Himself. So we can study those sacrifices. We can study that entire ceremonial system in order to understand about the ministry of Jesus. Jesus was able to teach from those scriptures, from those ceremonial law, all the things about Himself, and He convinced the disciples that it was He. And Jesus had to do this because if we depend only upon personal feeling, we will get deceived. It goes on and says, And they drew nigh unto the village whither they went, and he made as though he would have gone further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to tarry with them. And it came to pass as he sat at meat with them. He took bread and blessed it, and brake it, and gave them. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. Before Jesus revealed himself to them, he convinced them about the Messiah, through the written Word of God. He convinced them by using the ceremonial system. He began right there at Moses to show them that Jesus is the Messiah. And when they saw it, only then were they able to with witness Jesus personally. The only way we're going to be able to see Jesus to come again is to be able to understand some of those prophecies of the Old Testament, some of those things in the sanctuary service and how they apply to us today. You see in Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, it talks about the work of our Jesus Christ. What is Jesus doing today? Hebrews chapter 8, verses 1 through 5 says, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. Now this is the conclusion of all these chapters from chapters 1 through 7. 
Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. We have what? We have an high priest. When? Today. And Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1 identifies that priest. Hebrews 3 verse 1 says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Jesus is our high priest. Right now, the priestly ministry continues. The high priest is no longer a man here on earth. The high priest is Jesus Christ himself. And where is he? It says, Hebrews 8, again, verse 1, Now the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest, Jesus Christ, who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And what is he doing up there? What is he doing at the right hand of the majesty in the heavens? The next verse tells us what his work is. It says, A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. So he is ministering in the heavenly sanctuary. There is a sanctuary there in which Jesus, our high priest, is ministering in. How do we know what's going on up there? How do we know what is ministering in that sanctuary? It goes on, for every high priest is ordained to offer gifts and sacrifices. Wherefore, it is of necessity that this man has somewhat also to offer. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law, who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God, when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, said he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. You see, when Moses was about to make the tabernacle, when they were designing the sanctuary service, it was made after the pattern. It was made after the temple up in heaven. And Jesus is now ministering in that temple. And as we study the ceremonial law, as we study what was required in that law, it points us forward, it points us upward to the work of Jesus that He's doing right now in the heavenly sanctuary. No, we don't go to those ceremonial law. Those are done away. We are living now in the reality. We are living in what they pointed forward to. For this reason, let us look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. You see, that ceremonial law had to be done away with because that ceremonial law pointed forward to the work of Jesus. We can study it to understand the lessons, but Jesus is now in the reality. And because we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Right now, we can have the confidence, we can have the assurance that we can go to the sanctuary up in heaven, that we come to Jesus with our sins. We can place ourselves at the altar of sacrifice and give it all to Jesus. Let Jesus take it all. He is there ministering for us. My question for you today is, do you want to Jesus to take your sins, then take a look at the law that was done away with, that law that was nailed to the cross. Take a look at it. Look at what Jesus is doing for you and me today, and that will bring out that love of God into your heart and draw you closer to Jesus. May you make that decision today.